Welcome to the Middle East Institute. Uh, thanks for coming. This is the sixth lecture in the series, and uh, I will be talking to you about the rise and fall of Neo-Ottoman Turkey. And I will start with a puzzle right away. This puzzle will uh, take us through the whole lecture. It will essentially drive the whole lecture, so please bear with me as I lay out the puzzle in the next uh, five, 10 minutes. Well, some of you may be too young to remember this, but uh, about eight, nine years ago, Turkey was hailed as a model country to the Middle East at a time when the Arab uprisings were opening up new possibilities across the region, particularly in countries like Egypt uh, and Tunisia. And Turkey was hailed as a model because it was seen as a Muslim country that worked, essentially. And what was meant by that was a number of things. One, it had a Muslim leadership led by the then uh, Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan, who had very strong roots in the Islamic movement of Turkey, but also had very strong, in fact, excellent relations with the West, both the European Union and the United States. Second, the same Muslim leadership showed incredible, spectacular economic performance, steady growth rate, high growth rate every year, a Muslim country that was getting richer and richer and not on the basis of any natural resource, oil or gas, a story that we would be familiar with from you know, other regions like the Gulf, right? Third, and perhaps most importantly, by the time Turkey was hailed as a model to the rest of the Middle East, the same Muslim leadership had managed to push the military out of national politics, pushed it back into its barracks, so to speak. And this was a watershed development in a country where you have a long history of military involvement in national politics through very openly, sometimes uh, through coup d'etats, and other times not very openly uh, through backdoor channels pressuring the civilian governments. For you to grasp the importance of, of, of this, one only needs to look at countries like Egypt or Pakistan, where you have similarly very long histories of military involvement in, in national politics, and that tradition continues today. In Egypt, you have a military rule. In Pakistan, it's very hard to form a civilian government without the tacit approval of the military. So another important point about these military rulers or military elites uh, ruling the countries essentially is that they had very strong links to the West, particularly to the United States, links that were forged during the Cold War. And because of that, majority of conservative Muslims who were essentially uh, left out of the decision-making processes in these countries were naturally anti-Western. They, they harbored anti-Western sentiments because of this uh, link between the West and, that, uh, and the small number of uh, elite rulers who happened to be secular as well. So bearing that in mind, when we look at Turkey, it was kind of miraculous that it was a Muslim leadership that had very strong roots in an Islamic movement, yet had excellent relations with the West. So now, all of this gave Turkey a lot of international prestige. I'm talking about 10 years ago. International prestige, both in the Muslim world, because it was a Muslim country that worked, um, but also in the West as well, because the Muslim leadership had excellent relations with the West. And this emboldened the Muslim leadership, this prestige um, and attention and the economic performance emboldened the Muslim leadership, particularly um, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, who wanted to convert it into economic and cultural influence in the region and beyond it. And it had the economic resources to do so because economically Turkey was getting richer and richer uh, each year. And 
the analysts at the time observed this process and basically analyzed it under the rubric of neo-Ottomanism, right? With reference to Turkey's Ottoman past, where you had the imperial borders, um, okay, where you had the imperial borders um, extending in the west from the Balkans, Eastern Europe to Northern Africa, and in the west from the Caucasus, in the east, sorry, from the Caucasus to the Gulf and the Hejaz. So this was uh, Neo-Ottomanism in a nutshell about eight, nine years ago. Now let's fast forward to this day we have a looming economic crisis in Turkey. Um, there is a Muslim leadership, the same, mus the same leadership actually, that ruled um, Turkey about 10 years ago, led by President Recep Tayyip Erdogan, who doesn't quite enjoy the prestige that he used to have, uh, especially in the West. Third, and perhaps most importantly, just two years ago, in 2016, in July 15th, um, the army, which everybody thought was pacified and was in the barracks, uh, and which was seen as the hallmark of Turkey's uh, democratization, was out on the streets once again for a coup attempt against President Recep Tayyip Erdogan. And it basically on that night, the Turkish state came to the brink of collapse. So in a matter of five, six years, Turkey went from being sort of a new imperial uh, regional powerhouse with extensive economic and cultural influence beyond the region as well, to a state that was vulnerable enough and almost at the brink of collapse. So there was no more talk of neo-Ottomanism at that time. In a way, if you, if you were to use a very crude analogy, Turks have relived what the Ottomans went through in five centuries in a matter of a decade, the rise and fall of, of their empire. Now, this is the puzzle. How do we explain the very sudden, seemingly very sudden rise of a country growing very confident, rich, um, and quite aggressive in its foreign policy to a country that is vulnerable, on alert, and almost losing everything. Uh, I'm referring to the coup um, attempt uh, in, on July 15, two years ago. So to explain this puzzle, I will take you back in time and also shift the focus from the president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, to another, um, sorry, I, I think I forgot to show you some slides from the coup attempt. So I will, I will take you back in time and I will shift the focus from the president to another uh, group of actors who have played a very significant role in the rise and fall of the Ottoman Empire, but who haven't uh, received uh, the due attention because much of the attention was focused on President Erdogan. And these are the so-called Anatolian Tigers. This is a loose network of pious businessmen from various provinces of Turkey who grew rich in the 1980s um, when Turkey was, Turkish economy was liberalized, basically following on the wave of liberal policies uh, globally initiated by uh, Thatcher in, in Britain and Reagan in, in the United States. So the importance of the rise of these pious businessmen in the provinces of Turkey lies in the fact that traditionally the business circles, the business world in Turkey have been secular and have been a quite small uh, network of secular families with their own family networks and associations. So the growing wealth in Muslim hands meant that these pious businessmen wanted to also ele elevate their Muslim fellows in, 
in Anatolian provinces who have been essentially left out of the government and business circles. This was very understandable. And so they were ready to spend some of the wealth that they accumulated uh, upon the liberalization of Turkey in various philanthropic, charity, uh, education-based uh, projects. And one community, one religious community, stood out for its philanthropic ambitions. And that is the followers of Fethullah Gülen. Um, Fethullah Gülen was a charismatic uh, mosque preacher who moved from uh, town to town uh, in the 1970s. And by the 1980s, his, among his followers were some of these Anatolian tigers who were ready to uh, give some of their wealth in exchange for um, quite ambitious projects of schools and businesses uh, and so on and so forth. And the basic promise of Fethullah Gülen was to create a golden generation, meaning raising a highly educated, modern educated Muslim youth who would be very active in every sector of state and society in Turkey. So be it media, economy, uh, education, uh, bureaucracy, what have you. This is no small promise in a country where the upper echelons of state bureaucracy and the business world were held by traditionally secular uh, elites who were allied with the West, right? So there was a significant overlap between these two communities, Anatolian Tigers and the Gülenists, right? These were interlocking uh, networks and there was a significant overlap between them. But we, weren't, we wouldn't be talking about them if it wasn't for a very significant event that changed everything. And I'm referring to the collapse of the Soviet Union here, which is of course a world historical event, so it's important in that regard, but it was particularly important for Turkey because Turkey used to be a Cold War ally of the West in the communist frontier, having borders, sharing borders with the Soviet Union around the Black Sea, uh, in the Caucasus, and, rest, and the rest of the uh, Eastern European communist world in Bulgaria and Romania. So Turkey was a big asset. So when the Cold War ended, Turkey was essentially one of the victors of the war. And it was with its liberalized and globally integrated economy and with its emboldened Muslim communities, it was ready to reach out into a dying Soviet Union. Particularly in the Caucasus and Central Asia where you have now independent uh, formerly Soviet republics with Muslim majority populations. And at the forefront of this reaching out into the Muslim brethren were, again, Anatolian Tigers and, and the Fethullah uh, Gülenist network, which had, as I said, a very strong overlap. So they went out building schools and businesses. There were cultural associations they uh, send significant aid. There's a lot of volunteer energy around this reaching out into uh, the Soviet Union, particularly in, in the regions I'm talking about. So as they cross this ideological frontier of the Cold War, the mission of creating a golden generation acquired a global dimension because now they were not only raising a youth back home in Turkey, who would then be active in, in, in the Turkish state and society, but they were bringing former communists and nominal Muslims into the fold of Islam, right? And this mission ha go went hand in hand with bringing former communists into the fold of global capitalism. Now I remind you, in the 80s, Turkish economy was liberalized, as I said, and these are Muslim uh, communities emboldened by this liberalization, growing very rich, and were ready to take up the task of going there and bringing these nominal Muslims, former communists, into the fold of both Islam and global capitalism at the same time. And Turkish state supported them. Um, 
by basically allowing the students who were educated in the Gülenist schools in Central Asia and the Caucasus to continue their education in Turkey. Turkish state also sent a lot of aid um, to these countries. So there was also an overlap, a collaboration between the Turkish state and um, the Anatolian Tigers and the Gülenists. And this process of state network collaboration in Central Asia and the Caucasus was closely watched by the United States, the ultimate victor of the Cold War, right? At the time, the, U the US was highly invested in creating a buffer zone in the former enemy lines. That buffer zone would extend from the Caucasus into Central Asia. And it wouldn't, not only would it buffer against uh, Moscow, but also against Iran. Now, mind you, Iran used to be a Cold War ally of the West as well. Um, but with 1979 revolution, they began to espouse a version of political Islam that was very anti-Western. So with that one move of state uh, network collaboration from Turkey into Central Asia, the US was politically sponsoring a project that enabled it to uh, cut between Moscow and Tehran. And this was not the first time the US was working with uh, religious groups across the former Cold War frontiers. Um, in the 1980s, during the uh, Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, uh, the US leadership also worked very closely with the Arab and Afghan Mujahideen in Afghanistan. And this was basically the US-Saudi uh, partnership extending from the Gulf into Central Asia against uh, Moscow. So while all that was happening back home in Turkey, the, another story was unfolding, which was not one of collaboration, but intense rivalry. The rivalry was between the secular elites and the Islamists. So this is the more usual uh, familiar story that we, are, uh, uh, that, that we know of from other countries as well. So there was a rising Islamist movement in Turkey, and they came head to head with the secular elites who, had, uh, who essentially controlled the state. And President Recep Tayyip Erdogan, comes from that circle of uh, Islamists, anti-Western Islamists, originally. So they, to start with, they had very different uh, outlooks. And eventually, the rivalry got so intense that it engulfed ev even the Gülenists, who were collaborating with the state outside and were not anti-Western and uh, business friendly and so on, but it engulfed them as well and uh, pushed uh, Fethullah Gülen to go to the United States in a self-imposed uh, exile, where he still lives today. So what, what this created, so this happened in uh, 1999, uh, I believe. The result of this was a disjuncture. So at home in Turkey, the Gülenists had to keep a very low profile. They basically had to hide. Um, in Islamic terms, they dissimulated, which means that they pretended that they wouldn't be part of this community. Um, and outside, they were very confident, comfortable, expanding, building new schools, building new businesses. And in fact, they were still collaborating with the Turkish state. There was this interesting fact of Turkish state having uh, a fight with the Islamists, but also in, with, the Mus with, the group, uh, with the broader Muslim community, including the Gülenists, because the Turkish state was afraid of them infiltrating the Turkish state on the one hand. On the other hand, outside, they were helping Turkish state, you know, building uh, cultural and economic uh, influence abroad. So while they were dissimulating, uh, keeping a low profile in Turkey, the Gülenists were basically building a diaspora, a global diaspora of schools and businesses across the world. So by the end of the 1990s, 
you could come across with Gulenis anywhere in the world, virtually. In Thailand, in Colombia, in Latin America, in South Africa, Russia, everywhere. And this disjuncture ended with coming to power of uh, Erdogan and his party, AK Party, in 2003. So Erdogan claimed at the time that he basically had left behind his anti-Western Islamist roots. But despite that, the secular establishment, which controlled the state, remained very suspicious of him. And so it, which put him in a very vulnerable situation, spot where he needed new cadres with, with whom he could populate the bureaucracy, the judiciary, the army, you know, the police, in a way so that they could protect him against the secular establishment. The only community that he could turn to was the Gulenists, because they were the only Muslim community that raised such a generation of pious Muslims who would be more loyal uh, to Erdogan at a time when he feels very vulnerable. So this was very understandable. This was a very understandable move. And the Gulenists actually proved to be a very strong ally. Um, in a matter of five to seven years, uh, through a series of trials, reforms, constitutional changes, what have you, they were, ab they were able to manage um, pacifying the Turkish army in terms of its influence in domestic politics, um, pacifying the judiciary again in terms of its traditional role in, in Turkish politics, but um, also populating the bureaucracy in such a way that the state was essentially now coming under the control of Erdogan. So what we have, what we analyzed back in time as the democratization of Turkey, transformation of Turkey, etc., was done through this collaboration, collaboration between uh, Erdogan and this Gülenist network. It was not only at home though, on the outside as well, Erdogan was capitalizing on the Gülenist networks. Turkey opened embassies in countries where Gülenists were very active. And Turkish Airlines then added those countries and cities into its networks of destinations and becoming the number one airline flying to more destinations than any other airline today, essentially. And through these businesses and schools and students circulating uh, through Gülenist networks, Turkey accumulated a lot of uh, prestige. So this branding on the basis of the Gülenist infrastructure uh, brought uh, a lot of human resources, a lot of prestige, uh, circulated a lot of new ideas in and out of Turkey. Turkey was now at the center of a global network of uh, people, businesses, uh, schools. So this was essentially the infrastructure of Neo-Ottomanism. Uh, Neo-Ottomanism was essentially a case of the flag following trade. Trade basically done by the original Anatolian Tigers. And the face of this Turkish miracle, what was the Turkish miracle? The Turkish miracle was that all of a sudden you have a country that was uh, run by a Muslim leadership, yet very friendly with the West, managed to push back its military, uh, representing a Muslim majority that was somehow not anti-Western. So this was uh, the Turkish miracle, incredible uh, economic performance, and Erdogan became the political face of it, right? Uh, let me see. Yes, you, ha you have him on the cover of Time where uh, it says Turkey's pro-Islamic leader has built his secular, democratic, Western-friendly nation into a regional powerhouse. Pro-Islamic uh, leader establishing secular, democratic, uh, regional powerhouse, but can his example save the Arab Spring? And you have uh, on the right side a photo, I think, from Egypt in Cairo where the Egyptians holding up a 
posters of Erdogan. Erdogan was received during the Arab Spring uh, almost like a pre prime minister of, or president of uh, Egypt itself. So this is the perspective that we are familiar with or circulating in the newspapers. But seen from the perspective of the Gülenis, this was incredibly lopsided image of what, what unfolded in Turkey over the course of uh, 20 so years, right? In a way, Erdogan's image claimed the whole thing, but left out the role of Anatolian tigers and, and the Gülenis. Not on purpose, it's just the nature of uh, uh, media attention. So from their perspective, there was one state, but there were essentially two sultans. That's the way uh, they, 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 they saw the story. Uh, because after all, it was the human resources developed within the country, the golden generation, and the economic and, uh, economic and cultural networks that they established outside, outside that, they, that became the infrastructure, or the, the basis for Erdogan's stardom on the world stage. So for them, Gülen, the, the leader of the movement, had at least equal, if not more, share in the story that was not reflected. And the problems began at that point, when the two men were at the height of their individual power within the Turkish state, and when they were collaborating very intensely, uh, both at home and abroad. Think of uh, two business partners who grew rich you know, uh, together over the years, but as they grew rich, also they became quite suspicious of each other's intentions of maybe one is uh, slowly thinking of taking down the other and claiming the whole business for himself. So that is what happened. I will not bore you with the details of each episode of how uh, their fight unfolded over the last decade, but a crucial uh, event happened uh, in, the, in late 2013 when Gülenist um, cadres nestled in the judiciary and the police force br brought a series of corruption charges against Erdogan's cabinet, which of course destabilized uh, politics at the time. Erdogan not only survived the scandal, he went on to win the presidential elections. And after that, he was very determined, committed to purge the Gülenis out, out of the state. That was an incredibly important moment. I, I want to remind you also that he went out and pressured other governments to close, shut down all the businesses and, and schools that Gülens were operating in, in other countries. So basically what he was doing is that he was dismantling with his very own hands the very infrastructure of neo-Ottomanism that carried him uh, into the world stage, right? Both inside and the outside. And this was also an existential threat to the Gülenists themselves. If they were to be purged out of the Turkish state, they were going to lose all the power except as a diaspora across the world. And they came back uh, with an ultimate move in 2016, uh, July 15th. The Gülenis, the generals uh, who were in the Turkish army, basically orchestrated a coup attempt against uh, Erdogan and brought the that was the sort of the pinnacle or the peak of, of, of their fight. And because Gülenis were politically sponsored by the US since the end of the Cold War, and because the US uh, were, has remained largely silent on the coup d'etat issue, that Turks to this day remain very suspicious of the close link between uh, the Gülenis and, and the US. 
And as Erdogan purged the Gülenis out of Turkish state, Turkey became destabilized, both economically, it lost mo almost all the infrastructure that enabled it to grow rich. Gülenis were holding key positions and were a very important link between Turkey and the West. So in a way, their departure from the Turkish state and this uh, intense fight between Erdogan and uh, Gülen, their falling out, became the reason why Turkey went from the height of imperial expansion, so to speak, to the brink of collapse in a matter of five years. So I will, um, before ending the lecture and uh, opening the floor for questions, I want to end this with um, two, sorry, I, yeah, this is the coup, two takeaways uh, from the Turkish story. One is, and this is mostly aimed at uh, st students, uh, undergraduates. Um, one is the importance of transnational networks, particularly networks of religion and business in augmenting or subverting uh, states, both from within and from outside. So this is not a story of uh, transnational network sort of scheming uh, 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 sort of the uh, a takeover of the state from the beginning. It's, it's a process. But in this process, we see how the rise and fall of a transnational network has a significant if, if, uh, impact on the transformation of a modern state that we wouldn't be able to see unless we shift our perspective from the presidents and political parties and elections and so on to these social processes, uh, which include very unlikely characters like businessmen, volunteers, teachers, educators who come in and out of political space uh, and have a very um, uh, important uh, direct impact on, on the way uh, on, the, on the political journey of a country. So that's one uh, takeaway. The second takeaway is about the geographic and temporal uh, scale of analysis. We usually, you know, the, I started the lecture with the Arab Spring and the role of, uh, the you know, Turkey being a political model and um, the rise and fall of New Ottoman Turkey. How do we explain that? And we ended up finding the answers first in the Cold War and also elsewhere in the Caucasus and Central Asia in the former Soviet space, which is not necessarily the traditional, you know, within the traditional scope of the Middle East. So it is important to follow events and actors and figures wherever they go. And then as we follow them into other regions or globally, it makes a difference that when we makes a difference when we bring that analysis back into our examination of the issue at hand regionally. So we wouldn't gain any of these insights if we were insistent on explaining everything within the Middle Eastern context or within the Turkish national context. So there's a case to be made uh, for the importance of a transregional scale. In this case, a scale that cuts across the Middle East and the former Soviet space. Thank you for listening to me and uh, I'm ready for your questions. My question is uh, regarding Hezbo Tahrir. Okay. Uh, some of my Central Asian friends uh, like mentioned about, uh, about that uh, the Hezbo Tahrir and growing Islamism uh, in, in, the cen in Central Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, my question and some have gone to the length of saying that, oh, Hezbollah Tahrir, a lot of influence is coming from Turkey. So I want to know whether it is correct or not. Mm -hmm. uh, this is one question. And uh, again, another question, uh, uh, this is uh, regarding Xinjiang province uh, in, uh, in China. Uh, uh, th there is a lot of, uh, uh, I have gone through a lot of papers that says that there is Turkey in a way, um, very supportive of uh, of of the Uyghurs in in uh, in, in Xinjiang, 
but some uh, some uh, have gone to the extent of saying that like maybe they are ge getting some support from Turkey, m not maybe from the state, maybe from businesses and others. So I want to uh, to know your take and what is the relationship between uh, the kind of uh, political linkages of radical Islamism in in Central Asia and China and its link back to Turkey. Mm -hmm. Um, thanks. So about Hizbut Tahrir, I actually, um, I, I the, the easy answer is that I don't know. Uh, I think it requires uh, on the ground information about these uh, networks extending. Um, uh, I certainly don't know the extent uh, of how successful uh, Hizbut Tahrir is in recruiting Central Asians within Central Asia. Uh, I think this will link back to um, to your second question as well. It is true that Turkey has been a transit point for for not only Central Asians for a lot of groups uh, with a lot of goals and with a lot of missions. So a lot of it is uh, basically happening um, not under the purview of Turkish state necessarily, um, and it's also very hard to um, judge the quality of these networks because they grow out of already existing diasporic linkages. So Turkey is host to a um, significant uh, Central Asian population. They have their own neighborhoods in Istanbul. Uh, you could say that including the Afghans and um, uh, Uzbeks and, and, and Kyrgyz especially. And they they are not part of a necessarily a network, but there are times they're offshoots, or if there is a network of some sort, which can be very thin, you know, in its social basis, but can tap into these, these uh, deeper uh, social spaces. But, it's, uh, but it doesn't give us a reason to, to be suspicious of this, this uh, big, bigger social chunk. And it's the same with, with the Uyghurs. Uyghurs have diasporic uh, po uh, neighborhoods, uh, you know, presence in, in Turkey, not only in Istanbul, but in, in Anatolian uh, cities. Uh, some of whom are very active. Uh, they are activists. Uh, they're vocal. Uh, I, I suspect that they have links to other Uyghurs in, in the West, in Europe, in, in the United States. But they are not necessarily part of a network that is somehow um, um, that a, a network that reach, sort of that extends from you know Washington D.C. all the way to uh, Xinjiang. Um, so that's so that's roughly the picture. So Turkey is inevitably at the center of things and it is bound to be a transit point because it will not control every diasporic movement. Uh, it doesn't mean that this, there is a substantial network that is operating uh, under the purview of the state. So that's uh, my overall answer. Uh, one thing about uh, the Uyghurs uh, and the radical uh, Islamism, it is, um, I think there, the, the connections between uh, China's uh, Xinjiang region and, and Central Asia and Turkey were relatively, more, relatively stronger, say, 10 years ago. Uh, but with the recent uh, uh, clampdown uh, by, by the Chinese state, I think that that, that connection is, is severed, uh, uh, if not totally, mo I would say mostly. Um, so, yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Maybe I can add some points to your uh, presentation. My name is Erkan I am from New York Chambers in Singapore. I all the stories about the history. You described the, the, the collaboration between Erdogan and the Ukrainian movements. Actually, Erdogan is you know, elected president in Turkey. He yeah. has so maybe five, six times elected, probably five as prime minister and president. And you know, Turkey has a, a actually big history with democracy. We can start with Slovakian and Tatarian. After 
Okay, thanks, uh, thanks a lot for um, uh, reminding uh, me a, a few points about the, pre about the presentation where I um, should have maybe explained uh, what I meant by collaboration. Um, of course, uh, this, is, this was not an official collaboration because of a number of reasons. One is this community is not a community of registered members. Nobody uh, walks around, you know, with a, a name, you know, belonging to this community or anything. You can you can easily deny being one, actually, if you were caught doing something, you know. Uh, so that's one of the problems that Turkey has been facing since uh, 2013: uh, how to identify Gülenists in the Turkish state. What are the markers? Um, but there was collaboration in the sense that. When Erdogan opened the doors of the state to anyone, practically, who would come in and not, you know, s s protect uh, the elected ruler against any undemocratic force, it was the Gülenists who came in mostly, partly because they were the educated, uh, you know, Muslim generation in the country. So that is, uh, in a way, it it was sort of natural that the Gülenists would uh, make up much of, uh, much of the, um, the new cadres. So that's, that's what I meant. And, uh, and of course, uh, just to you know, clarify a few things, whenever I present on this thing, uh, I'm always, you know, people are trying to judge whether I'm on the side of uh, Erdogan or Gülenists. Um, the issue here is uh, not to present one side as, you know, as the ultimate innocent victim and the other side as, you know, the, uh, the scheming evil. Probably both sides have, have both, but it is important, one distinction is important. 
uh, uh, gentleman is, is very correct that Erdogan was an elected ruler, and that changes everything. Because an elected ruler, you can uh, still, he was accountable, he had to answer to, uh, the, uh, to the, um, to the uh, voters every uh, four or five years. Uh, he had to make a case. Whenever he had to change something, he had to go through the parliament. So he was following you know, what any uh, other ruler was following. So at the end of the day, the Turks had a say in this when as, you know, as far as uh, Erdogan's decisions were concerned. But no such channel or space was there in the case of Gülen. So that's a, that's a huge difference. And if there is any influence of the Gülenists in the state, and if they are doing something you know, back through backdoor channels, and some, th some things are changing in the face of things, but you don't understand, there's no way you can actually be involved part of uh, the process. So that's very correct that I would say if, the, if you were to categorize, you know, in terms of danger, there's no doubt that it is, in the long run, a good thing for the government to get rid of a network that, is, uh, that has no accountability whatsoever. So that's uh, um, definitely uh, true. Uh, about the model part, Turkey, that's also true. Turkey never, uh, Erdogan never went around and said, you know, the, you know, look at my country, this is the model. It was the outsiders, and particularly the West. Because imagine, you, uh, as Western countries, particularly the, the United States, uh, they had a very strong alliance with these you know, small ruling elites in countries like Egypt, Tunisia, etc. And they were uh, being ousted like one, one, one after another. Now the space was wide open. And traditionally what you expect is that the Muslim majority population, and if any leader sort of rises, and mobilizes the, uh, the, uh, the Muslim majority, it's bound to be anti-Western because of the sentiments that grew over decades against these uh, uh, authoritarian rulers. So what do you, where, where do you turn to? Turkey was the only country that the West could look at and see, oh, okay, this, there is a model. The model works. And actually, it's a country that can push back the military, what you know, uh, Tunisia, maybe uh, Egypt was going to do, yet remained friendly with the West, which is exactly what the West wanted, right? That's why Turkey became a model, not because Erdogan wanted or Erdogan uh, went around and publicized uh, the country. But the timing is uh, quite uh, uh, important, uh, that it became a model because the Arab Spring was opening up all these uh, new possibilities in, in, in the region. Um, Five. Okay, last point was, uh, actually the, perhaps the first point you made, was about um, the, oh, China. I think, okay, you, you made that point uh, clear, thanks. Any more questions? Yes? Oh, okay, uh, maybe a new person first. Hi, um, good evening. Um, your, just now your presentation, you were talking about Turkey's um, expansion of, um, you know, these fun, uh, funding into like, the Central Asian republics as a buffer against the Soviet Union against mm -hmm. Tehran. Um, I want to ask something beyond the Central Asian region. Do you see similar efforts being conducted by Turkey into this part of the world, into Southeast Asia, for example? Because um, one of the accusations that was made, not against Turkey, but like other against other states, for example, Saudi Arabia was that they were funding like um, they were funding like educational institutions mm. that were spreading their own ideology in this part of the world. Mm. And what I want to ask is whether or not Turkey has faced similar accusations, especially in recent years, in this part of the world. Yeah. Uh, short answer is no. Turkey. Um, so the the model of say the Gulf uh, Islamic expansion through charity networks or you know, charity uh, associations and foundations uh, is quite different from the way uh, Turkish communities uh, ex expanded into um, the Caucasus and Central Asia. There was, uh, in the original story of Turkey uh, reaching out into the Caucasus and Central Asia, there was this element of uh, Turkic brotherhood 
that um, was thought to be still alive, you know, after 70 years of communist rule. So more than the Muslim bond, it was that Turkic uh, brotherhood sentiment, which turned out to be not very uh, uh, strong, uh, or as strong as, as uh, Turks wanted to believe at the time. But that element is not present you know, in, in, in Southeast Asia. That's one. Second, um, Turkey's, I think, uh, that expansion was very original. So the expansion into to the Caucasus and Central Asia, that was not really replicated in anywhere, anywhere else. I mean, it, there was, uh, you know, a similar expansion maybe in the Balkans, in Crimea, sort of the, con in the contiguous landscape surrounding Turkey, but not necessarily in countries like South Africa, where the Gulenists were active, but with not a very thick social basis. So Turkey lacks that sort of social basis in, uh, in this part of the world on which it, it can build uh, that sort of uh, uh, cultural or economic expansion. It, I think uh, I, I've never uh, come across any such uh, accusation. I think tur recently Turkish, uh, for, there is a growing role in, of, the, of humanitarian aid in Turkish foreign policy. And in that way, Southeast Asia is being part of that process with the Rohingya crisis and so on, Sulawesi as well. Uh, whatever happens here, uh, I think uh, Turks keep an eye or they, they, they are sensitive to uh, developments, especially the Muslim uh, part of Southeast Asia. But other than that, uh, there's no, uh, it's a bit too geographically too far for Turkey to stretch. Um, yeah. Any more questions? I know one in reserve. No? Oh, yes, please. Um, so as the Syrian war is dwindling down, um, what do you see Turkey's role in the future being, um, especially as it's had greater alliances with Russia over the issues of Kurdish um, mm -hmm. populations and definitely pivot away from um, US, any kind of U.S. alliance, and do you see um, perhaps the rebuilding of Syria as an opportunity for uh, Turkey to be more of a regional power, or how has it influenced, especially in it's taking on lots of refugees over mm -hmm. the past um, few years? How do you see its role changing? Uh, okay, uh, there's lots of things there. One is um, Turkey's growing cooperation with uh, Iran and Russia over Syria. That's an important development. Uh, a lot of people see it as a, as a conver it's not a convergence of interests, they say, but uh, a convergence of um, um, sort of, there's a certain uh, understanding that they have, they share common enemies, but there's no actual strong uh, uh, commercial or uh, other uh, bond that, that, that bind them. I uh, don't believe that that is the case. Actually, uh, the fact that these, uh, the three presidents have been meeting very regularly in Sochi, Ankara, Tehran, uh, elsewhere, over since the beginning of 2017, and I remind, I my, this is this came basically six months after uh, the coup d'état attempt. So Turkey uh, was turning away from its uh, transatlantic patron uh, to uh, its close neighbors. This will have a, a long-term effect in the sense that these powers may not share, you know, they may not share uh, uh, the interests, but they, they, they now learn with each step how to manage uh, conflicting agendas without stepping on each other's toes. And that's an important uh, asset. So whatever they do in Syria, they make sure that they don't anger each other. And by doing so, so compromising with each other, they have a collective say in Syria's future. So when Syria is finally ready for reconstruction, Turkey will have a role, along with Iran and Russia and so on. So, and that is one thing that all these powers are fighting for. Uh, don't be mistaken that you know, there's, there's, there's a war and a lot of uh, uh, money is going in, the transnational networks uh, drawn from many, many places, states involved and so on, but this is partly a fight for the future of Syria and its reconstruction. So there's, there's that element, very strong. So Turkey will be, that is, so one answer is that Turkey will be in Syria in ways that 
it, go beyond what Turkey, Turkish state can imagine because of these uh, now very strong geographical and family links that have been formed that was not there before. Uh, millions of Syrians. I mean, you know, when uh, thousands of Syrians cross the border into Germany, it becomes a crisis in the e European Union. There are more than three million uh, Syrians in Turkey. What is the population of uh, Singapore? Uh, 3.5, I believe, Singaporean citizens. Uh, yeah, so Turkey is hosting, you know, uh, a, a population as big as uh, Singaporean. So that's, that's huge. And it's doing that without, without really significant aid from the rest of the world. And it's doing without huge social problems. You would expect that the country would blow up with you know, that many people coming in in just a matter of years. But if history is any, uh, gives us any lesson, it, one of them is that uh, immigration in the long run pays off in the sense that the Syrians, uh, some of them will go back, but a lot of them will stay. And they will be a force in the country. They're learning Turkish. They're, there's, there will be a, an added energy uh, Turkey will have in the, in the next uh, decade or so. But we don't know what the consequences of that energy will be. Uh, hopefully uh, positive on Turkey. So that's, uh, that's one. There's so much uh, packed in, in the question, so that I'm trying to uh, open it up. Um, so um, the, having said all of this, this doesn't mean that Turkey would move away from the West. I think that's one thing that's not going to happen. Turkey will not get out of NATO, but NATO will probably lose its importance anyway. Um, Turkey will not, will never severe its uh, relations with the, e with, the, with, with the European Union. No way. None of these will happen. I think what, will, what is more likely to happen is a, a new balance in which Turkey will not be only uh, um, bound to its uh, former Cold War uh, patron across the Atlantic, but will have, will have its eggs spread across multiple baskets, which includes the EU. Uh, as you know, Erdogan is uh, regularly meeting not only with uh, Russian and Iranian presidents, but also a lot of uh, presidents in, in, in the EU. So it will be a more Eurasian, uh, maybe Euro Afro-Eurasian uh, context to Turkey's uh, sort of international uh, uh, journey uh, from now on. But the, it's... It's not going to be black and white as in you know, Turkey turning to China instead of the US and so on. That is, uh, it's a bit too far-fetched. Any more questions? No, yes, don't be shy. Yes. Hi, I'm Sharon I'm from the, I'm a graduate student at the Department of Geography. Uh, I guess my question boots on the previous, so, how can we understand, um, in this case, New Ottomanism as distinct or similar to Eurasianism, especially in the context of Turkey pivoting itself towards Russia or Central Asia away from the West? Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, Eurasianism, uh, uh, do you use the term Eurasianism in terms of ne Russia's neo-Eurasianism? Like this, okay, uh, Kremlin-based, uh, okay. Uh, Eurasianism has a history that goes back to the 1920s and uh, was developed by uh, diasporic Russians uh, in, in Europe. And it kind of died uh, later on uh, during the Soviet period and it was revived in the post-Soviet period, particularly uh, under uh, Putin. Um, and it uh, arguably it, uh, draw uh, Putin's um, more aggressive foreign policy within the former Soviet orbit. Um, there is another take on Eurasianism in the Turkish context, which is not the same thing, but maybe a little similar. Uh, outsiders don't know this much, but uh, there is a Eurasianist movement in Turkey, which uh, basically argues for severing ties with NATO and cutting off, uh, basically ending the Cold War alliance once and for all and turning to uh, a a Eurasian context. And one, one may say that actually what is happening today is sort of similar to what these guys have been arguing, you know, all along. Uh, not exactly, but, you know, roughly. So that's, uh, um, 
one thing, you know, how Turkey uh, comes in the Eurasian context. But in terms of the Kremlin's ambitions of, uh, well, in, the, in this uh, Eurasianism, Moscow is this, in a way, is the center of the world. And uh, Russia is neither a European or an Asian country. And it doesn't have to choose one because it is a unique country uh, with a, 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 a history and, 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 and special geography of its own. And other countries can define themselves vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Kremlin. So um, Turkey doesn't have a particular place in that ideology. If we are talking about the project of Eurasian Economic Union, for example, uh, of Russia, that includes Kazakhstan, includes uh, Armenia, Belarus, I think. Uh, that is, I think, more, say, equivalent to the neo Ottomanist project in terms of maybe uh, it's, it's uh, uh, the quality of, you know, sort of an imperial expansion uh, within it in the context of nation states. That's, the, that's roughly the uh, thing. In that case, uh, the reach of uh, the Kremlin is limited to the former Soviet space. That's why Eurasian Economic Union didn't really uh, you know, uh, uh, take off, uh, except a few countries. And even in countries like Kazakhstan, for example, where, which is part of the Eurasian Economic Union, they continued to have very good relations with the rest of the world, and including Turkey. So it didn't come at the expense of you know, uh, uh, any other project, be it neo-Eurasian, uh, neo-Ottomanism, and so on. Another rival, one may say, of neo-Ottomanism would be uh, Iran's Shia Crescent, what has been referred as Iran's Shia Crescent. And all these happened simultaneously, interestingly. It all started in the early 2000s. I mean, the infrastructure was laid out. And they came to fruition maybe the beginning of 2010. So in 2010, you look at the Middle East and actually the broader West Asia, you see Russia's neo-Eurasianism, Iran's Shia Crescent and Turkey's neo-Ottomanism were kind of uh, operating in parallel terms. And the small states around them had to choose one over the other, which is not the case anymore. So that thing is over. So a country like Kazakhstan, uh, Georgia, any, take any small state in the region, they, don't, they are not now faced with these rival uh, ideological big state moves. Because these big states are now collaborating actually among themselves, the small states can uh, put themselves in the picture by collaborating with all of them at once. And that is what is happening with uh, a number of countries in, in, in the Caucasus and, and, and Central Asia. But that's a bit of uh, tangent there, but thanks. <laughs>